Work really does matter. I've been sharing over the past couple of weeks on, you know, what does Jesus think about work? Um, and last week, what he expects of all of us who are workers and, or bosses. So you can download those messages from our uh, CFC app or on YouTube. If you miss a Sunday, uh, you can do that. It's a wonderfully convenient thing to have, particularly when you're travelling a lot like I do. You can download the messages, which is uh, terrific. Um, the scripture that I want to focus on, I read it last week in the message and the NIV translation, um, but it's, it's a classic scripture. And though the context, and I shared on this last week, has to do with, with a slave society, the Roman Empire, where most of the work was actually done by 10, 15 million slaves and the Romans were the bosses, uh, I'm using this passage in our context, taking the timeless transferable truths that apply to us. So let's read it and let's get practical about work, hey? I want to share some, some practical pointers that the, the great apostle makes. He says, employees, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favour when their eye is on you, but as slaves of Christ doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people, because you know that the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do, whether they are slave or free. And masters, bosses, employers, treat your slaves, your employees, your workers, in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no favoritism with him. I reckon a lot of our values in relation to work come from our families, our parents, and the older I get, uh, the more I appreciate my mum and dad. And uh, my uh, mum's been in heaven since 1993, and dad since 2006, and, and I think of them often. And uh, as a little kid, I didn't appreciate uh, their work ethic, really. You know, children tend to be quite self-centred and they want to receive and not so much give. Um, but boy, when I think of mum and dad, they modelled a most positive work ethic for me. And dad, for example, he owned a market garden. In fact, he owned the airport road. You know, you drive from Henley Beach Road to Burbage Road. He owned that. Can you believe it? Then the government stole it from him. They did compensate him. Then he bought another property, about four or five acres, uh, right next door on Lipset Terrace, and now there's all units there. And so we grew up with, with uh, uh, dairy cows and little calves, and, and uh, what else did we have? Oh, 20 cats, so there were no mice in the place. Um, glass houses, cauliflowers, lettuces, uh, a whole pile of stuff. It was actually a good life, a great life. But my dad's philosophy was, you don't just give pocket money to kids. Like he saw Anglos just giving the kids pocket money and the kids not respecting their parents. So the good Greek value was no work, no pay. So um, if I wanted pocket money, I had to work in the glass houses. And glass houses, for those who don't know, you, you, they're there because they're made of glass and you put tomatoes in there, and so when the frost comes, it doesn't destroy them. And at times, Dad would put a little, little furnace at the end and just make sure when the real cold snaps came so that the uh, tomatoes would grow. So we kids had to, there were wires right across the glass house. We had to, and I was, wasn't that tall then, I'm seven or eight years of age, had to tie the strings on there. It had to be done the right way, because if you pulled it, they came off. And then those strings had to be tied to the tomatoes, and. So I had to, I mean, there's thousands of strings that you've got to do. Real boring, tedious work. But I had to do it, otherwise I wouldn't get my pocket money. Or then he'd say, well, you get a bit older, he gives you more responsibility. Uh, son, it's time for you to pick the tomatoes. So, okay, so he's not looking. And I would just go by and just go, do it quick. Like, what should be two hours? I do it home, just pick, pick, pick them. And as I'm picking them, I'm busting them in half. So he comes back and sees all these broken tomatoes and it says, you know, so he says, well, no pay for that. 
Okay, son, you can't do that because you've destroyed next week's crop and the week after. You've broken the whole stem. You can't do that. So I like, okay, got caught there. So the next time, I said, okay, I'll just grab every tomato I can find. So green, yellow, red, I just fill the box up, did the work in half an hour, that should be two hours. And he'd say, you can't pick the green ones, you can't. And he taught me how you tap a tomato on the bottom, okay? Just tap it on the bottom and you kind of feel, and it's ready to drop out of your hand. So you just a little bit of a twist and off it comes. So I'm an expert on how to grow tomatoes. <laughs> Carrying cauliflowers, cutting them, lettuces. And, um, and my dad, would make sure that not only did I do it, but I would do it to the best of my ability. And I didn't realise at the time, even though I hated it, because all the other kids just got money and I'd check on them at school and they didn't have to do all their chores, I had to. But now I look back and I think, boy, that was character forming. I didn't realise the values he was imparting to me. And, And so now I'm so thankful for it. And so all of you who are young parents follow my dad's example, and you'll produce magnificent kids. What does he say here? So I reckon dad, he didn't use the scripture, and, uh, but uh, the principles here, uh, he really outworked in, in the most godly, godly fashion. And uh, the other thing with dad, his generosity was, was just mind blowing because there were times where um, the frost would come and destroy, even with glass houses. Sometimes that would just destroy the crop. So the whole year's gone. No money for the next six months. And uh, I remember going with Dad to the Bank of Adelaide in Hindley Street. And uh, so he had to go and take out a loan. And, and it was just so good because I remember the bank manager was, oh, Stan, come in. What's happening? And Dad would say, oh, no worries. We will, we will loan you. And it was almost like because they knew that he would always pay his debts weekly he would go without so there wasn't even any thinking they trusted him implicitly and said oh yes then what do you need and he would pay it and then he would give every few months a huge parcel of goods that he would send back to the island of Vicaria to his family very poor place and sometimes I'd get very resentful because we would go without I thought we were going without but he would always still give even in the midst of his poverty as he was raising four kids, he would be thinking of those in his homeland and be generous. And mum always had a great big pot of stew and, and anyone that would come in, they would be able to eat something. And sometimes I used to get resentful and think, can't we have a meal on our own? Do there always have to be strangers? But I, I look back and I think, you know, those, the values they taught me of work and generosity uh, just were imbibed within my own character and life. And, and, this is, and they were, didn't know the Lord then, but they were following biblical principles. And Paul here gives us some fantastic statements. So if you're a worker, if you're an employee, let me give you some, some things, what to be. Be respectful. Verse 5 says, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear. The same word as is used when he talks about kids obeying their parents, he uses here. And it's interesting in that passage of Ephesians, as some people misconstrue it, like he doesn't actually say wives obey your husbands. Did you realise that? Some men read that and think wives obey. He actually doesn't. It just says honouring. So the obedience aspect has to do with children obeying their parents and employees obeying their, their masters. He talks about in, in, in a marriage relationship, but it's a mutual relationship. Headship doesn't have to do with forcing obedience. And so uh, different words that are used, beautiful, very liberated. He was a, a liberated man. In fact, he, he predated women's liberation. In fact, women's liberation is women's oppression compared to the Apostle Paul, what he actually taught. When you read that and you understand it, the concepts of what he talked about, the equality and dignity of being under the creator God and being, have, being redeemed is, is brilliant. So poor Paul gets misrepresented uh, by some of the translations, unfortunately. So this is a, a wonderful statement, be respectful. And what he's saying is, with fear, it's not the correct word. And uh, if you read Eugene Peterson's The, the Message, it, it's better. But it's, it's not a cringing civility before a human master, but rather a reverent acknowledgement of the Jesus whose authority the boss represents. That's what he's saying. Obey your earthly masters with respect. Now, what if the boss is not worthy of respect? 
Have you ever had a situation where your boss is really not worthy of respect? Well, I've had that. When I was at university, four years, the job that I had in my holiday period was as a builder's labourer. And uh, so I, I worked probably four months a year as a builder's labourer. And I was very thankful that they paid well. In fact, I gained a healthy respect for the union movement because they made sure that, that working conditions were good, that good pay, because it was pretty heavy work. And, uh, but I had a foreman that was really terrible. Um, I still remember him. I still remember his name, Bob. And the big bad Bob, that's the memory that I have. And so he would, he would come up to us and, and uh, let's say, uh, Evan, he'd say, he wouldn't call you by name, he'd say, hey, Labour, Labour, over here. He'd say, hey, hey Labour, David, said, over here. Labour, that job there, like. And, and he'd, he'd do that with me and I, everything within me nearly used to yell out and say, my name is Bill and I like the sound of that name. Could you please use it? Because I felt disrespected. Hey, Labour, uh, uh, you know, like you, 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 uh, do that. It was terrible, week in and week out. And so, <laughs> so I... And other young university employees, who knows whether he had an attitude towards the uni kids, you know, maybe he was an uneducated man, maybe he worked his way up the system, maybe he had a bad experience with other uni students that were arrogant and thought they could, and, and, but it was just awful. And, uh, <laughs> and so, did I reciprocate? I felt like it. I felt like giving a bit of, a bit of my Greek mind, my Vasilakis mind, but I knew I'd get sacked straight away and the money was really good. So you've got to kind of look at that very honestly. And, uh, and then I started thinking, well, has he asked me to break the law? No. Has he asked me to do something unethical or immoral? No. Has he asked me to do something dangerous? No. Has he asked me to cause somebody else to stumble? No. He's just being rude and disrespectful to me. And so I had to deal with that matter. Either I quit... <laughs> But, you know, I wasn't compelled to be in that job. In Paul's day, he goes, these slaves were compelled. They, they had no choice. They had to. And so what Paul is saying is that our work that we render to our earthly bosses, he goes, you've got to be change the equation and you're offering it to Jesus himself. And so do your work, he's saying, as if Jesus is your personal supervisor. So it wasn't Big Bad Bob, it was Jesus that was my boss. So I'm serving him, I'm not serving Bob. It changed my thinking patterns. Just now, if he asked me to do something immoral, unethical, hurtful, dangerous, illegal, I would have quit. No question, I'm black and white. But he didn't. And so I found uh, an answer here in, in, what Paul, in what Paul wrote. And... Uh, the second thing we see, he says, be sincere and act with sincerity or singleness of heart. He says, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and act with sincerity or singleness of heart. In other words, folks, with integrity and without hypocrisy and without ulterior motives, honesty of purpose and a wholehearted effort must characterise Christ followers in their work situation. And he goes on to say, be conscientious. Obey them not only to win their favour, I like this one, when their eyes on you, so when they're watching, I behave well and I do a good job. But what about when they're not watching? He goes, no, obey them not only to win their favour when their eyes on you, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. So do we work only when the boss is watching in order to earn favour with him? Can you be trusted to work hard even when the boss isn't around, folks? Or are you cutting corners? He's not around, so you're slacking off and the quality goes down. Jesus is watching all the time. He's your boss. And uh, he's never deceived by shoddy work. The Christian ideal is that no work should be done carelessly, but rather it should be done conscientiously. And that's why I'm thankful to Dad that he would pick on those things when I didn't do it well. So he didn't give me a choice. Son, you've got to do it to the best of your ability. And then when I think back, 
of how he rewarded me, man, he actually gave me a decent amount of pocket money. I think I got more. I don't remember poverty as a child. I don't remember poverty. Even though he went without, in the home he made sure. So, so I never had this kind of... Whereas my wife, I mean, she went through great poverty in the same era. And in the 60s, the late 50s, early 60s, there was a lot of poverty around. And so, so, so I never experienced that, even though there were tough times. And so uh, I, I found that my dad taught us by the power of his own example that we've got to be conscientious as we work. And, and as Paul says here, be wholehearted, verse 7, serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people. In other words, we work with willingness and cheerfulness instead of being reluctant or in a grudging manner. So here's another question then. What about tedious work, difficult work, or some aspects of your work that are just not nice? In fact, they're, they're quite terrible. In, in this builder's laborer's work, I mean, like, they needed to get organised. So there, there are a couple of us that were working on this building site, and there was a huge second level. So what they wanted was for it to be clean when they would put up the, the, the woodwork the, for the next story. So you've got to clean it. Go sweep it. Okay, sweep it really clean. No, no dirt. So we did that, and we did that the first day, then the second day, and the third day. And we must have done it about ten times. There was no other work for us to do. So there was only just a, a, a few little things there. And I felt like saying to them, hey, Bob, why don't you wait till it really gets dirty? And then just before you put it up, get us up there, we'll do it. But now give us some real work to do. That's what I felt like saying. But no, we had to do it their way. And I thought, what a waste of time. What poor organisation. And so I'm, I'm sweeping. But I tell you what. When I swept that floor, it was so clean, if you spilt your lunch on it, you could have eaten off the floor. I thought, you know what, I'm going to, even though it's a waste of time, even though they've got to get themselves organised, and I thought, you know what, I'll, still, I'll make sure these floors are the cleanest, jolly floors you can find anywhere in the world. And uh, I did it with all my heart. Every single piece of work a Christian produces must be good enough to show Jesus. That's what Paul is saying. Now, that was terrible work, really. It was a bit of a waste for me. But I, it, you get transformed when you bring Jesus into the equation. He who died for us, he who lives for us, who who redeemed our life from the dead by, the sac by his own sacrifice on a cross, and he's changed our hearts and he's given us new life and a home in heaven. And he wants us to live a life here in this world that reflects his character and his nature so that people will see Jesus in us. Because if you react the same way as, as the world does, there's no difference between us and, and people in the world. But there's, there's a massive difference. Christ is in our lives. And uh, the resurrected Saviour now lives within us through the Holy Spirit. And everything changes. And your paradigm changes. Um, I think the worst job I had was cleaning toilets. And um, you might say, oh, toilets are not too bad. You're thinking of your toilet that's reasonably clean. <laughs> the toilets that I clean were the dirtiest, rottenest, filthiest toilets in the whole of Adelaide. The toilets of a drive-in theatre. Remember what drive-in theatres were? We used to have them everywhere. Now there's only one in Adelaide. I mean, drive-in theatres. I, I, what people get up to in drive-in theatres is not to be spoken. But you've got to clean the messes up. And so it's like, man, every cigarette butt, every bit of vomit, it's like, ah, and th that's outside. Then you go inside into the toilets. Whoa, man alive. Yeah, 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 that is. That's the worst job in the world. You know, God's got a sense of humor because this is 1976, I graduate. I've got two university degrees. I'm a qualified teacher. I've got a diploma in theology ministry. I'm ready for action. Like, I'm a really qualified guy. I'm Greek. My parents know I've graduated. They now expect big bucks to come in. That is payback time. <laughs> like, board and extra money. So I'm thinking, okay, how do I? And God speaks to me. And the school wanted me to be a teacher full time. And God spoke to me and says, no. Nah, because I was called at 19 years of age to dedicate all my time and talents and gifts to serve him. 
And that, and when the door opened up, when he would give me the aid, he said, no, he goes, I want you to evangelise the schools. You're a registered teacher. He goes, you've got a youth group? And we had uh, about 100 young people in our youth group. And so we, we set up Christian groups in about a dozen schools. So I would meet with our young people, the leaders, and I would train them and teach them. We'd set up Christian, organize, Christian groups, Jesus clubs, in the schools. They would do all the work because, because a person outside could not. And then I would come in and just share the gospel or show a film. And I had an audience of 3,000 people some weeks. Half of them were non-believers, at least. On an average week, it was about 1,200 people that I would minister to. So I've got the largest congregation of sinners in Adelaide that I'm ministering to. Okay, so God called me to do that for about a two-year period, evangelise the schools and use my teaching degree. So I thought, well, look, getting a part-time teaching job would be the right one. So I think, where do I go? Oh, Mewden College, just about 100 metres from the Sturt Street Church. Park my car there. I go across the road. My sisters went to school there. So I went to see Mr Mewden. He goes, no, no work. All full up. No, I really felt that was the place for me. You know, no parking, no, no cost, just walk there, come back to my office area. And, no, and so then I thought, what do I do? How do I explain to my parents? So I went to the CES, the Commonwealth Employment Service. That's what they called them in those days. And as I'm walking in, I just uttered this prayer. It was like a prayer, but it was like, God, I need a job. And I just said this to the Lord, just said, I'll do anything. And the eyes of the Father in heaven opened up. Anything, Billy? You want to serve my purposes? You want to preach the gospel? What? And so when I went in there, I said to the woman, I said, I need a job. I need it today. I'll do anything. She goes, anything? <laughs> it's like the spirit came on her. <laughs> so, <laughs> and she gave me the job at the park line drive-in theatre. And I tell you, it was terrible. It was terrible from 6 o'clock in the morning to about 10 o'clock, four hours doing that. But you know, I honestly can tell you, I was thankful to God that I had the privilege of earning some money that I could hire films to take into the schools and pay my parents a decent amount of board and, and explain to them that a teaching job will open up sometime, like they're kind of looking at me. And, uh, and, so, and then in the second term, I get a call from Mr. Mewden from Mewden College. Bill, come in and see us. A job opened up, one hour a day, 9 to 10, teaching year 12 history, one of my favourite subjects. And, uh, and, you know, I got paid more for that one hour than I was doing four hours in that toilet cleaning job. And after I got it, I said, God, why didn't you supply this earlier? The pain I've gone through, the torment I've gone through. The, I'm allergic to all that stuff. But, you know, it was the best thing for me. It was character forming. It tested my heart. Was would I be prepared to do any work for Jesus? And when I saw it through the prism that I'm serving Jesus, I'm not serving an earthly boss. It was a wonderful character forming experience for me. All work is, is, is wonderful. There are no terrible jobs if you're a Christ follower. Jesus transforms our mindsets about work, folks, and, and our perspective gets radically changed. And the final thing Paul says here, for those who, who are, who are uh, employees, there's some other sections where he talks about those who are bosses. I won't touch that. He says, be eternally minded. Because you know that the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do, whether they are slave or free. He's saying Jesus is your judge and nothing escapes his scrutiny. And no good work will ever be left unrewarded by him. We are to give loyal service and our very best service to our boss, irrespective of the attitude the boss has towards us. To do it to the very best of our abilities. To, you know, to, to not do something half-baked. Oh, well, I've got a message to prepare today. Oh, no, what am I going to speak on? Imagine if I came with that lackadaisical attitude. Oh, I want to speak on, oh, yeah, maybe this and that, and, and I'm disorganised and, and my notes are gone everywhere. And like, I'm disrespecting you, I'm disrespecting myself, I'm disrespecting Jesus. But I try and think through carefully what I'm going to say. So I, I produce a manuscript and, and my executive assistant has it ready by five o'clock on Friday, down there in black and white. So I've thought it through. I've read myself full, I've prayed myself hot, I've reflected, and I've got to put it down because I'll deviate here, there, and everywhere, and we'll be here for three hours if I don't stick with this 
what I've put down here. Why? And if there's an error there, I'll try. And then, and then she might scrutinise. Say, oh, you know, maybe that. And then I show it to Kathy because sad day I do a little bit of editing. And I show it to her, and I really don't like showing it to her because she's typing it. She goes, you can't say that. I said, yes, I can. She goes, but you could word it a different way. You know, and, and, and like, I get a bit resentful about it. But, but I, I think, you know what, at least there's a perspective of somebody who's reading it and hearing it. They may not hear what I'm actually saying if I don't say it the right way. So I let her torture me Saturday afternoons a little bit <laughs> for your sake, to make sure that we give you the best stuff. Imagine if I came with an attitude, oh, I'll just do second best for you. You come out of your beds and come to church on Sunday mornings and we, with our musicians and our worship team and our kitchen, we want to give you the best experience. Why? Because we love you, but we obey Jesus. And we want to do it for him to the best of our ability. And that's how we should be with all of our work. The letter that you write, the person that you see, how you conduct yourself. How, you know, Kath and I went to a hotel in Athens that we stayed at. And we just, it, was, it was just opened up two days after we got, And we looked at it and we thought, what shoddy work. Paint that's on the marble. And, and it's like, wow. So I said to the bird, I said, if you tell your manager, if you haven't paid this guy, don't pay him. Tell him to come back and fix it up. And they looked at me and said, oh. I said, that's the Australian way. You don't do it right, you don't get paid. <laughs> I thought, what shoddy work, a new hotel, and they're kind of like, awful. So you've got to do it to the best of your ability. Hey, look, when I was at Mewden College in, in the final year, I went full-time employed by the church in 1980. So I taught for three years at the college, and, and uh, I, it was a wonderful experience. I, I wished I could have taught for 10 years. I loved teaching. I enjoyed it. And that final year, I was teaching from 9 till about 12. I got married halfway through the year. I knew I was coming to the Christian Family Centre. The decision was made that I'd come and become the, the leader in 1978, start towards the end of the year. And so uh, I must admit, my, the fervour for teaching was getting less in 1979 because the church was growing. I arrived in 78 and things were happening and I was working hard. So I'm teaching, getting up at, say, 6 or 7 in the morning, whatever, take Kath to work, teach 9 to 12, and then have an hour break. And then I'd, I'd start serving the Lord from like, you know, like 1 o'clock right through to 10 o'clock at night. Have, pick up Kathy, have a meal, then back to work. So I'm doing like 8, 9 hours for the church, another 3 hours uh, for, for, for the college. And halfway through, or well, the beginning of the second term, I came under great conviction by the Holy Spirit. Great, it was like I had a vision. And like I, I, I'm, I, know, I saw the face of Mr. Mutant at the end of the year, going like this. Good riddance to Vasilakis. All our kids failed that he taught because I was a slacker. And, I, and terror gripped my heart. What would they think of Jesus if all my kids failed? So I woke up. It wasn't a dream. It was like a, it was like a, a shock, Holy Spirit shocking me. And I made a decision. I said, you know what? From... 12 when I finish, through to about 3 o'clock, I'm going to mark all my assignments, I'm going to prepare my lessons and get myself ready for the next morning. Because I thought, oh, oh, and I actually did less work for the church for those next couple of terms and did more work for Mewden College, even though the church was growing. Hey, interestingly, Mewden College was paying me twice as much as the church anyway. When you think about it, the church couldn't afford to pay a lot, just expenses and a bit. So I came under great conviction to say, my serving of Jesus in my work and occupation, I wanted the opposite to occur. And when I finished up at the end of 1979, Mr. Mewden actually said, Bill, can you give us another year? I, I, I just, you're our best teacher. He said that, you're our best teacher. But don't tell the others, I want you. And I said, Mr. Mewden, I said, I'd love to. I love these kids. I said, but just the demands. I said, I, it's, just, it's just not possible. And I really felt great at the end, not in a sense of pride for me, but in a sense of I didn't disappoint Jesus. I did it for Jesus. And then I left them thinking, that Bill Vasilakis, he's a pastor. He did a great job. And all my girls matriculated. I had about 15 year 12 girls. And they all passed their, their year, year 12. And fantastic. So that was the most spiritual decision. One of the most spiritual decisions I made was actually to do less for a season in the church. And I'm the pastor. 
and do more in my work. You see, because there's no secular sacred division in work. It's all spiritual. There's no clergy laity distinction. We're all ministers, we're all missionaries. And whether you're a plumber, whether you're a teacher, whether you're a nurse, whether you're a doctor, whether you're working in the kitchen today, whether you're cleaning, music, preaching, you do it all to the best of your ability. You're serving Jesus. And we have wonderful people in our church who uh, exemplify this. And I've asked um, uh, Leslie Turner and Nikki Lockins to come and share a little bit about their journey. Come girls, and, and uh, because I reckon they are different journeys in life. And why I felt both should share is that Leslie is full-time serving in the church, not paid. Nikki serves as a volunteer, and she's got two other major work roles. Just on Leslie, as she starts, she's become a best-selling author. Halfway to Justice, The Power of Forgiveness, had been on the bestseller list. And, uh, um, and, and she has produced this. We dedicated this here at the church, didn't we? When, and uh, we wouldn't have The Me I Can Be, my first book, and she's actually doing my second and third, the church we can be, the leader I can be, and plus my personal life story, about 600 pages, they've taken it down, Nathan and her. So she's actually a writer. In fact, it shouldn't be my name here, it should be Bill Vasilakis and Leslie Turner. Next time we'll do that. And Leslie, just give us a little... How did you end up full-time serving in the church? Okay, you, you're not retired, you're refired. Okay, how's it all happened? that you've come to this point where you are now editing and writing and touching the lives of really tens of thousands of people through this ability? Well, I suppose it all started really from um, when uh, the, the, the last paid job that I had, um, the company was uh, downsizing here in South Australia, so most of us were um, made redundant. And so I thought, okay, what do I do now? I'm 50, 51 or 52. Um, and, uh, and, and I sort of thought, oh, maybe it's time I retired. But I don't think God was listening to that thought at all. Um, but uh, so for, you know, probably about 12 months or so, um, I sat at home and drank coffee and read, read the to-be-read pile of books that I had, which stood about that high. Um, and... <laughs> But um, Ken, whose story I wrote, um, came into you know into our our lives, just hold and it, uh, just hold it and he um, he and I started to uh, I was helping him. He's he's dyslexic and, and didn't know how to write letters and stuff like that. You know, so he'd had some problems, um, some big problems, and so he wanted letters written to people like. Um, well, the Premier, the Attorney General, you know, play, you know, just little people like that. And, um, uh, and so he asked me would I help him with, it, with that. And so I, that's what I did. I started to, started to do that sort of thing. And uh, the, the letters must have been pretty good because he ended up saying, would you like to write my book? And I thought, this man's crazy. But God got on my case. <laughs> actually, and, uh, and I ended up um, capitulating in the end and became, you know, I thought, I can give this a go. I'm not going to know whether I can do this unless I give it a go. But there were many times when I said things like, you got me into this, now you're going to have to help me with it because it was not the easiest thing in the world for someone who's never had any idea of actually writing a book. I didn't know how to start it, I didn't know what to do. But during the time that I was writing, I started coming to this church and Ian Hunter got me involved in um, re reception work and stuff like that, you know, and in, in the end I ended up doing five years of PA work for Norm Reed and, um, and it's just kind of progressed from there. Now I do more of this, this kind of stuff, but uh, that, that's what, what actually happened with that was I was asked to get involved in a, in a book. Um, here, um, as far as kind of editing and proofing and stuff like that. Um, and I thought, heck, I don't know how to do that, so I better learn. And so that's, that, that's, how, that's how all this has evolved over a, over a period of probably 17, 18 years now. 
Leslie, um, for those who don't know, the story has to do with the, 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 the terrible murder of, of a man's daughter. And um, it was a, a shocking thing where they knew the man was guilty, but they could not convict him. And actually the laws had to change to accommodate that. So actually not just halfway to justice, it actually changed the laws in South Australia. The man went on to murder another girl and committed suicide and, uh, on a second occasion. And, uh, and this one, the power of forgiveness, has to do with how the father came to a place of having to forgive before he destroyed his own life. And so uh, they're powerful books. So you can get them from Amazon.com. They're, they're e-books, yes. They're e-books, yeah, you can get them. Uh, Leslie, the other thing is, you said to me, you failed English or didn't pass? I failed, failed Year 10 English. So, you know, some of, the, some of the things I've done, like probably the most challenging thing that I've, that I've done as far as editing is concerned is a, a PhD thesis for Damien Zepesi, actually. Yeah. And um, that was 98,000 words. Yeah. Um, and uh, I went through that twice before, it actually, before I actually did a final proofread on it. So, so um, Leslie, your whole... The, the career paths that you had before this opened up, you were saying you could see God's hand guiding all you. All the way through, all the way through. I didn't yeah. recognise it at the time. Yeah. Like, you know, it, was, it took quite some time for me to really realise that, that God was serious about, yeah. you know, about my getting involved first of all in that. And then, like, you know, the progression from there yeah. to, to where I am today. Yeah, uh, wonderful. And, uh, and she's uh, been a blessing to the church here. And she's an example. If you think of retiring because you've reached a certain age, that word is a swear word for me. You call it refirement and you see what God has actually gifted you with and there's opportunity for you to serve Jesus in a fresh way, new way through the life of the church. And she exemplifies that. Talk with her. She'll, she'll encourage you. Now, somebody who's a little bit younger, <coughs> Nikki Loggins. Now, I asked Nick because she does three... She's got three jobs, basically, and, uh, and how she balances those... Those, those, that, that work, yeah. it is, all of it's important work. Nikki, share a little bit of your journey, at your age and experience, um, what God's saying to you and um, help us. It's just so great to hear um, Leslie's story in the fact that it's almost like the door had to close, there had to be a big no before she was able to say yes to just the seed of an opportunity and just to see how that's grown. Um, and that's probably a little bit... Um, uh, bit of what I want to share with my own journey um, and I just thought I'd give a bit of an example of something that happened when I was around um, 1920 and um, for those of, you, those of you that don't know me I'm a classical violinist and ever since I was a very little girl I've been in training um, in sort of very um, very intense training probably very similar to that of like an Olympic athlete on the violin and so I've practiced the violin seven days a week for many hours a day because I wanted to be a concert violinist. And um, I was right in the middle of my studies and um, on the cusp of a bit of a breakthrough in my career as a 19, 20 year old. And I felt like God had really whispered to me just through a very everyday conversation with another person about um, giving a day a week as Sabbath. And for me, that was not a great conversation. And I felt like God just sort of it was like a little dart in the heart, just a little, a little flutter, but I just knew that God spoke through that conversation. And it was a challenge to me to give up a day a week of my very intense um, regime of practice to, to serve God, to have space in my life and um, actually attend church regularly. And, um, and I knew that it was God asking me to be obedient and he just orchestrated the conversation to be that way. This was a very big deal because um, the regime that I was doing really required seven full days a week. I did not get a day off. I didn't have a day off in years. And um, I had to um, really grapple with what was the motivation as to why I was doing things because I knew that God had led me that far and I knew that God wanted me to play the violin and, and um, he was opening doors for me in my career. So I wasn't questioning whether God was leading me down that path. But I just knew that this was one of those moments where God wanted to know if I would put him first. Mm. And he was asking me to be obedient. So after a while of grappling with it, I decided to be obedient. And I started giving my Sundays, um, giving my Sundays up with practice and rehearsals and all sorts of things. And I started going to church regularly. And 
um, connecting in in relationships because I found I was around people a lot, but I wasn't truly connected in with godly relationships. It was very important for me at that time in my life um, and ever since to be connected um, with people, with godly people who can speak into my life and also to serve God in the church. And um, the wonderful thing about, I think, being obedient and is that God is so good. <laughs> um, I, only within months of making that decision, um, my career, I won this competition and my career kind of skyrocketed and instead of um, going the direction that I wanted, it I almost jumped about five steps and so I was suddenly sort of thrown into this, um, the career that I'd always wanted but I thought it was a few years away. <laughs> Um, and then also at the same time, through church and through being connected in, in relationships and serving, I fell in love with this pretty awesome guy down here. So I think that was pretty cool. <laughs> and, um, and I just think that that's, that's an example where there's been so many times down the in my life where God has led me to a point of having to put him first in my decision making. And I think, as Dad talked about, you know, we, the Bible's talking about serving God as a worker and, and often it's referring to people that were in jobs where they didn't have a choice and they were slaves, but we're not slaves here, praise the Lord. And um, we have a lot of choice and we've got choice in how we go about making decisions for our jobs. And I just think that we can be we can often get enslaved in the way that we think, where we think we judge our job and success by what's just the next step. And we need to take time with every decision to allow God to whisper into our heart whether this is the right thing for us. And things like whether to take a promotion. The world says yes, but God may not say that because it might take something away from your family life. It might not be the right time. Or whether to work really hard to buy that big house the world says yes, but God might be saying no because he, he might be calling you to ministry part-time and to leave your job part-time. And if you have a massive mortgage, you may be restricted from that. And so I just really feel like um, the thing that I can share is that God often says no and asks us to say no to things first before we can actually step in and say yes to things. And so whether there's, if that's spoken to anyone in your life, whether in your life right now there's something that you are needing to say no to that's um, instead of being something that um, is enhancing your career it'd be saying no to something so that you're making time for God in your life and putting him first and I really trust that he will take you on a journey that maybe you didn't expect but I guarantee you it's a greater purpose to really be stepping in his will and to be open to serving him in ways that you never knew so that's my bit that's great Nikki just um um, you're a mother of three children. Yep. You're a pastor's wife. You serve within the church in, in areas of ministry. And you are a musician, extraordinary musician. And I went to her concert on Thursday night. And so you're doing three major things. Yep. Um, I mean, you impressed me as somebody who, it's not a matter of doing it all, a hundred, like, everything you want to do at the same, but somehow you've been able to balance it, and I see Christ guiding you in it. Um, do you want to just say something about being a mum and being a, being a career and also a minister? How do you balance that in God? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, um, it's very clear that, I mean, motherhood is, for me, I, only I am going to be the mother to my children. Um, so that's my first role over everything. And the decisions that I take with work and with serving in the church, um, they, they come out of the framework of knowing, well, what, what's my most important role? Um, I think the challenge is how much you take on. And for me, um, for some of you, that you know that we have a, an extra challenging um, home life um, and some additional needs with our kids. And I feel like I have every reason to say no to anything extra because my life is so intense and just sometimes getting through the day with my kids is far enough. But I do feel like God does whisper to me about saying yes to things and that it's not just important for me, um, it's important for my family, it's important for my kids to see that too. And so I do think that there's times where he, he wants me to step out and take a road where it would be easier to not have to... Um, you know, to take on additional things. It would be easy to stay home and keep things very calm at home. Um, but I think it's just a balance and, and you can't... 
There's some times where I do feel like I've taken on too much responsibility and then I suddenly think, oh dear, I really need to step back and readjust that. And so I think it's a constant, it's a constant journey of asking God first and then stepping out and then readjusting along the way, but being open to how he's leading you. And the same goes with my career. I mean, I don't even really think of my career as a career anymore because um, it's... But I know that God's, God's given me this opportunity with my music and so I don't take that lightly. But um, as far as planning and putting all of my identity in that and, um, you know, I just sort of have an attitude of God. If you open up a door... I'll be obedient to that, but for now I know that my most important role is being a mum and I also want to show my kids, um, you know, what it's like to serve God and, um, yeah, give them a chance. Yeah, that's great. I, 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 when I look at Nikki and, and Leslie, I see that there's, there's a seamlessness to their serving Jesus as Christ followers, whether it's in Korea, whether it's writing books, in the church, outside. And so you exemplify, both of you, as uh, women in the church, what the Apostle Paul has been saying. Let's put our hands together and thank them, eh? Good. Let's stand together.